thought leadership from PwC. Welcome to PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in for the second of four episodes covering implications arising from the conflict stemming from the Russian government's invasion of Ukraine. Today, we'll take a deep dive into the U.S. and other government sanctions, including running through all the different tranches, what they all mean, and then at the end, we'll wrap up on what you should be doing now as a finance professional. We have never seen um, a sanctions campaign that has moved as quickly, as aggressively, and in such a multilateral fashion um, as the one against Russia has. Companies that have never really had to think about this are now re-examining their compliance programs. Those are my guests, Eric Lober, a principal in PwC's Cyber Risk and Regulatory Consulting Solutions, and Jeanette Chu, a managing director in PwC's Expert Controls and Trade Sanctions Group. Eric and Jeanette opened my eyes to the breadth and depth of the sanctions, so stay tuned to fill in some of the gaps in your sanction knowledge. So Eric and Jeanette, thanks so much for joining me today. Definitely an area where I think most of the U.S. population has learned a lot more than they knew maybe a month you know, or, or more ago, but still an area where we have a lot of questions. And in particular, I also know this is the area that's changing a lot. And so just to level set for the listeners, we're recording this on March 24th. And so by the time you listen to this, things may be, even have shifted more. But a lot of what we're going to talk about will be applicable, even if there are some changes here. But Eric, maybe to start things off, I know there's even been some recent developments. So can you share the latest and then we'll get into some detail? Thanks so much, Heather. Yeah, great to be here with you and everybody. And of course, great to be here with a, a true expert and all this stuff as well, uh, my colleague, Jeanette. Um, there have been developments as of this morning. Uh, the U.S. Department of the Treasury announced new sanctions uh, against 48 Russian uh, defense companies or companies in the defense sector, as well as uh, a, a number, I think 328 uh, members of the Russian Duma, which is essentially the lower house of the parliament. So uh, a range of new sanctions actions taken today. In fact, um, even while we were preparing to jump on this uh, this conversation, we got word that uh, President Biden may have called for Russia to be kicked out of the G20. Um, so yes, there's uh, always something moving. I will say that those of us who've been closely following the space over the last month uh, have become accustomed to uh, operating uh, very quickly and in response to sanctions and export control developments because there has been a major action or set of actions pretty much taking place um, on a weekly or even uh, sometimes on a daily basis uh, beginning since the Russian invasion uh, just about a month ago. So before we get into the details and how I got here, I have one broad question. So we've been talking to Craig Stromberg, who is from PwC Intelligence, kind of giving us the overall lay of the land. And at the end, I do want to get into some broad questions about sanctions and how they work and whether they work. But can you guys, are there other examples where we have, to your point, Eric, move so quickly and taken so many steps to take sanctions against a particular country? Or is this sort of unprecedented even in that way? It is unprecedented. I will say um, the, the administration here in the United States, along with the EU, the UK, Canada, Australia, and others, um, have taken a very, very aggressive actions in a very short period of time. Now, one thing to note is um, the, the planning for the actions that they've taken um, took, took place over a period of months prior to the Russian invasion. We knew that you know, the Biden administration had been putting into place options uh, to target Russian companies in various ways and, and coordinating with allies. So there was a ramp up period um, in which they were able to prepare for it. But I will say we have never seen um, a sanctions campaign that has moved as quickly as aggressively and in such a multilateral fashion um, as the one against Russia has. So before we get into current events, I know there's some background that we you need to understand, sort of understand what's going on today. So how did we get here? So as as you know, a lot of the sanctions that you see today were actually 
put in place, or at least the legislative and regulatory basis for them, were put in place subsequent to the annexation of Crimea in 2014. So there were multiple tranches, if you will, of sanctions activity. So the way that sanctions operate is that there are executive orders that come out from the administration, but for this particular situation involving the conflict in Ukraine, um, there there were also legislative initiatives. And in particular, there was the um, Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act, which is a piece of legislation that was passed by Congress and signed into law in 2017. And that included a piece, a subset called CRIREA, or Countering Russian Influence in Europe and Eurasia Act of 2017. So these things provided the foundation for executive branch agencies like the Departments of Treasury and Commerce to take actions against Russian aggression. Before we get into the latest sanctions, just curious, because I think most of our listeners would have generally heard that there were sanctions before. But does it surprise you that people are not more familiar with these or not really because they, for most businesses, wouldn't have had too much of like a day-to-day impact? Right. So I think particularly financial institutions were well aware um, in the kind of 2014 and post period about the sanctions obligations that they had. And the reason for that is the sanctions that were put into place during that period of time, 2014, were very sophisticated and in some some cases um, very challenging to comply with, just to get the kind of nature of what they restricted. And so banks in particular had to deal with these issues and had to figure out what it looked like. I think maybe the difference now, um, and Jeanette, I'd love your thoughts on this too, is that with the range of sanctions that have been imposed over the last month, they're touching not just the financial sector, but a whole, whole, huge host of other sectors that have operations in Russia, right? So I'll just give you an example. If you're a, a U.S. corporate and you have employees, even contractors who are, who are living in Russia or working in Russia, and those contractors or employees have bank accounts with some of the newly sanctioned Russian financial institutions, all of a sudden you've got a problem because you may have trouble actually paying those employees because you can't deposit those funds into the block to, into the accounts that are held at these sanctioned financial institutions. So it really went from an issue where financial institutions and energy companies and others were, were really focused on it in the sort of 2014 post period to a period where really anyone who's doing business in Russia now has to worry about it and is very much front and center. Jeanette, interested for your thoughts on that too. Yeah, I completely agree, first of all, Eric, with what you said. Also, banks have been dealing with this for a very long time, right, because of anti-money laundering regulations and so forth. So this whole concept of additional due diligence measures is not unknown, is not foreign to banks. With regard to what you see now, particularly the overlay of export controls, which is more my niche area, you know, it used to be that people would think, ah, export controls, I don't need to think about that. I just deal with pencils or consumer goods or what have you. And, oh, that's something that I'm not selling things that go boom. So it doesn't matter. Well, now it does, in fact, matter um, because it is such a very broad swath. And because export controls in recent years have really become a very important foreign policy tool. Um, that has been levied not just in Russia, but in many other contexts as well. So to Eric's point, all of a sudden, companies that have never really had to think about this are now reexamining their compliance programs. And they're saying, wait a minute, am I going to be able to pay my employees? Should I still be there? There's the reputational damage, of course, right? But there's also, who am I doing business with? And it's one thing if I if I have a clear list that I can just scrub against and say, okay, I'm not going to do business with these this morning's list of 300 plus parties or individuals. That's easy. But if it's something that is more like, oh, well, you know, they could be a military end user, but what does that really mean? Could that be, for example, a hospital that is owned and operated? by a military unit or by an army or something like that, right? These become much more fact-specific issues. 
So since we're talking about paying employees, I, I do want us to get to the broad sort of um, list of sanctions, but I think one that most people listening, because we're finance people, would have heard of is the fact that the Russian banks are being cut off of SWIFT. Mm -hmm. And may, again, what is exactly does that mean? Because I have to admit, my 19-year-old was quizzing me about this yesterday, and I said, I sort of know, but let me ask the experts tomorrow. And I, I think I'm probably this, not the only one listening that's in that position. Yeah, happy to answer that question. And I hope after I'm done answering it, your 19-year-old uh, finds my answer to be uh, comprehensible. Um, <laughs> so, so basically, um, SWIFT uh, is um, an interbank messaging system that facilitates uh, payment messages going back and forth um, from financial institutions. Now, what happened a few weeks ago is SWIFT ceased providing services to a number of Russian financial institutions, not all of them. So there are still quite a few Russian financial institutions that remain on SWIFT, but certain Russian financial institutions can now no longer send payment messages through the SWIFT network. Um, what it means in practice is it means that those uh, entities that have been you know, sort of de-SWIFTed uh, is sort of how people think about it or say it, um, have a much harder time processing um, international transactions, sending and receiving payment messages. They can still do it. So you can still use a fax machine, for example, to tell another financial institution to debit this account, this amount of money or whatever the transaction is. It just becomes much costlier um, and more burdensome to do. Um, you've seen the the, the the swift approach or the de-swifting approach used in, in a, a few other contexts before. The most notable one is in the Iran sanctions program. Um, what's interesting here, though, is uh, the, the de-swifting of the Russian financial institutions, the ones that were de-swifted, really actually came at the, at the behest and the pushing of, of European governments. In the Iran context, it was the U.S. government that was primarily responsible for pushing SWIFT to, uh, to de-SWIFT certain Iranian financial institutions. But here, actually, you had the UK government as well as EU governments uh, initiating and sort of driving that push. All right. That's definitely helpful. And I, I do want to get to sort of the impact on the Russian people of all of these sanctions. But we've been, I keep saying I'm going to ask, so I'm going to ask finally, is what can you guys give us the lay of the land overall of where we are from a sanctions perspective? Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, maybe I'll start off answering this and then Jeanette, I'll turn to you on the export control point. Sure. Thanks. So, um, so there's a lot, as I'm sure everyone on this call and listening knows, uh, I count seven different categories or types of restrictions that have been put into place over the last, um, over the last month. There are new restrictions on financial institutions and financial activity. There's new restrictions on energy and energy transactions. There are new restrictions uh, related to certain geographic areas. There are new restrictions related to certain natural persons, so Russian oligarchs uh, and economic elite, for example. There are certain restrictions on Belarus. There are certain restrictions on Russian defense firms. And that just came out this morning, as I mentioned. And then as I, as I alluded to at the beginning of the conversation or this question, uh, there are certain new export control restrictions that are in place. And not to give that short shrift because the expansion of, that, of the export controls, as Jeanette will talk about, was, was quite, quite broad and really notable. Um, I won't necessarily go through each of those seven categories because I don't think people want to be on the podcast for an hour listening to me drone on. But to give you a sense of how expansive it is, that first category, restrictions on financial activity, I count six different subcategories of restrictions, right? So there are blocking sanctions on some of the largest Russian banks, meaning U.S. persons can't do any transactions with them. And if they get their uh, property, they have to freeze it. Likewise, there's a new directive that prohibits any transactions with Spurbank, which is the largest Russian financial institution. So really massive, um, massive uh, sanctions that target massive Russian FIs. Um, in addition, sorry, FIs, financial institutions. In addition, Thank you. even in that financial transaction category, there are new debt and equity restrictions. There are prohibitions on U.S. persons doing any transactions with the Russian central bank. There are restrictions, new restrictions on transactions in Russian sovereign debt. 
And then there are the SWIFT related uh, cutoffs that we were just discussing. So you really do get a sense when you sort of go down the list of the actions that have been taken that it's, it's quite massive. I should also note that the seven categories I just delineated, um, I, I base it sort of off of the U.S. regulatory changes. But many of these, not all of them, but many of them are mirrored by the other jurisdictions I mentioned, the U.K., EU, Canada, Australia, so on and so forth. So you can see two things really clearly. One, you can see the scope of the prohibitions that have been put into place are just massive. And two, you can actually also see why it's such a compliance challenge and why businesses have been so focused on this because you know there are so many new regulatory requirements that have been put into place that they have to abide by to make sure that they're not running afoul of the law. And in addition, and as I mentioned, there's sometimes discrepancy between what the UK, the US, the EU does. And so if you're a multinational firm, you have to work to abide by each of those regulatory obligations, even in situations where they may not line up one-to-one. And then Jeanette, how about from an export control perspective? Listening to these financial sanctions that Eric just described, you would think, oh my goodness, what more could possibly happen, right? In the world of export controls, there was a tranche that came out in late February concentrating on what are called dual-use products, such as microelectronics. And they were targeted to limit the ability of the Russian government to acquire the means to continue their aggression, right? So a couple of highlights to note with this. One, um, there was the designation of a number of companies and on something called the entity list, which severely limits the ability to be able to import certain goods and technology from the United States. Typically, when a party is placed on the entity list, there is a policy of a presumption of denial, meaning that it triggers a license requirement. You have to go in to the Bureau of Industry and Security and prove that the transaction that you want to enter into is not contrary to U.S. interests and um, that that there may be a greater good. And in that kind of a situation, it may be possible to have a license issued. What shifted is this licensing policy to a policy of denial, meaning there's not even an avenue to go in and apply for an export license. It expanded control over items uh, over almost the entire commerce control list, the commerce control list has 10 categories, zero through nine. Um, the most recent sanctions actually cover everything from categories three through nine. So telecommunications items, navigation equipment, aircraft components. You may have heard, for example, of the grounding of aircraft. Um, there's been notifications that have been put out about certain aircraft and other uh, vessels that cannot be serviced, for example, regardless of where they may be located. So you could not provision, for example, a U.S. origin part or component, um, a spare part, if something is broken. There have been expansions to the definition of what is considered to be a military end user and a movement of parties from a military end user list to the Treasury Department's specially designated nationals list. Um, which is uh, has more more re- draconian restrictions, if you will, and the expansion is something called the foreign direct product rule, which really is an extraterritorial application, and this is something that a lot of companies, a lot of people, don't realize that U.S. export controls are extraterritorial in scope. They don't just affect what you do here. In other words, I put something in a box and I set it somewhere, and now I can't. This also, for example, if I had a factory, let's say somewhere else in Europe, because that factory might be making something that uses U.S. equipment or maybe uses U.S. technology, like let's say to manufacture semiconductor chips, those would be captured by the foreign direct product rule, which would say that this foreign made item is subject to U.S. jurisdiction and cannot go to the Russia, to the Russian um, government or military or um, certain end users in Russia. 
Wow. That's definitely a lot to think about. And I think if I'm counting right, we only covered two categories so far, although Eric, maybe you hit a few more when you were running through those. Anything else in those categories that you would highlight, Eric, as things that sort of the general listener may want to be aware of? Yeah, absolutely. So a couple things. Um, One thing which is sort of broadly applicable, maybe three things. One thing which is broadly applicable, one thing which is um, giving a a lot of companies challenges, and then a third thing which is more sort of 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 news interest. Um, On the first, uh, the U.S. did put in place a ban on the import of Russian origin energy products. So this is basically the oil import ban. The U.S. actually doesn't import that much um, energy from Russia. I think at the number is around 5%. So it's pretty small. Um, but it does show that the U.S. is, is definitely willing to, to escalate to energy. Um, and the big question, and so the political minds right now, is whether or not the Europeans would, would follow suit and, and include certain types of energy restrictions. Um, that's number one. Number two is the, the issue, which is actually causing a lot of uh, challenges, particularly for for tech companies and for companies that rely on electronic interface or have employees in Ukraine. Uh, and that's the geographic restrictions that I mentioned. So there are two areas, uh, two regions in eastern Ukraine, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, which um, were recognized as independent uh, by the Russians uh, in, in late February. And as a result, the U.S. said, uh, essentially, they, they, those two regions became comprehensively embargoed jurisdictions, right? U.S. persons can't do any business there. The challenge is these are regions, right? They're not countries. And so figuring out, for example, if someone is, is accessing um, your, you know, your technology or you know, your online um, shopping system or a payment system from those regions is actually quite complicated. You can try to do things like um, IP blocking, geo blocking, but if someone's using a VPN, it's very challenging to figure out just whether or not uh, they're coming from those those blocked regions. So that's actually something that we've seen a lot of our customers in the technology and in the fintech space having to really try to address, um, and with, with with varying degrees of approaches, and I think varying degrees of success. Um, the one other item um, which I will mention, you know, I, I, I talked about how there have been a range of natural person designations, right? So sanctions on individuals, and a lot of Russian oligarchs have been recently designated as a result of, you know, of, of the Russian invasion. The reason I raise this is it's very newsworthy because everyone sees, you know, the seizure of yachts and planes yeah. and all these, you know, like high ticket items. But it actually also poses some very serious compliance challenges because these Russian oligarchs, you know, they're, many of them are billionaires. They have assets all across the world. And oftentimes those assets are not in their names, right? They're set up or they're owned you know, through you know, shell companies that are established in jurisdictions where those jurisdictions don't necessarily have the most transparent financial crimes uh, standards. And so it's really challenging oftentimes for banks and for others to try to figure out, hey... Like, is this property, is this company owned by an oligarch or not? And, and this is not something which is new to, uh, to Jeanette's point from earlier about, you know, trying to figure out, hey, is this owned by a, by an S, by a blocked person or a sanctioned person? U.S. companies and, and non-U.S. companies have been doing this for a long time, banks in particular. But the scope of it is new because when you have 20 or 30 new oligarchs who are designated and they have billions of dollars spread in non-transparent ways throughout the international financial system, identifying that and figuring it out and, and blocking it if necessary is actually a pretty substantial task. So there really is a lot behind the kind of splashy, you know, oh, they got, you know, a yacht associated with Vladimir Putin, you know, that was in a Mediterranean port somewhere. Mm-hmm. Are they going to block the sale of a football team in England? There's another exactly. one that got a lot of headlines. Exactly. Yeah, I think yeah. also behind the headlines is the fact that it's one thing. Again, if you ha- if you clearly know who you can't do business with or who you can't make a payment to or lend money to, that's one thing. But for some of these, like for example, a military end user. Again, how do you define that? How do you define a government end user? How do you? What do you do when? something might or might not be list-based, or if it goes beyond purely a list. There's also a principle in sanctions 
um, called the OFAC 50% rule, which means that any entity that is owned in the aggregate more than 50% by a specially designated national or SDN. So for example, if I owned 39%, Eric comes along, takes another 12%, right? We tip that 50% mark. So anything that tips that 50% mark but maybe Eric is doing this through a shell company, which would not be, you know, improbable. What then, Heather, do you do, right? So that's part of the compliance challenge. And that is part of why companies are struggling to figure out, you know, how do we respond? So Eric, then if I put that all together, what's sort of what would be your high level summary? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the high level summary is um, there are, you know, as I mentioned, really these kind of seven different types of sanctions or export control categories. The really big one that everyone's sort of paying attention to uh, is sort of in the financial, uh, the financial restriction space um, and also the export control space. But there are these other ones, three in particular, that we've seen that are, that are causing lots of uh, consternation and challenges for compliance uh, among, among you know, U.S. businesses and non-U.S. businesses. And those are uh, new restrictions in the energy space, uh, new geographic restrictions on the two regions in eastern Ukraine. Uh, and then um, trying to figure out really uh, with oligarchs and the other Russian sanctioned persons, just how far their, their ownership interests go in property um, across the world. Because they're adept, again, as, I, as, as we both mentioned, at using front and shell companies to really obfuscate their true ownership interests. So, Eric, it's already a lot. You mentioned at the very beginning that Biden, uh, President Biden is also talking about potentially kicking or trying to get Russia kicked out of the G20. What would be the impact? Like, does that, is that a meaningful change or that's more of a just another indicator that Russia are no longer part of our sort of international community? It's a great question. I mean, candidly, I sort of view it as, a, as more of a symbolic move. The G20 is an important institution. It's more of a convening institution um, where the agenda is sort of set and, and some challenging issues and that, that, are, uh, that need to be addressed by, by the top 20 size economies in the world really are trying to figure out in the global economy. So it's less of a direct... If you're out of the G20, then you're subject to an additional set of penalties or an additional set of sanctions. But it is a recognition that Russia has been really roundly condemned for its actions in Ukraine. Um, I will also say that you know we're we're all sort of waiting to see what the long-term economic impact of the sanctions is going to be on Russia. It will obviously be, I think, we can all agree, pretty substantial. Um, and so. You know, Russia is no longer going to be one of the world's largest economies following uh, following its invasion. So, Eric, that's actually a good lead into a couple follow on questions I have. And I'm going to try to limit the next one because I'm definitely not asking you to explain why sanctions versus physical war and all of all of that, because that's obviously a, a big decision that all these countries are making. Uh, but what in it, what is the expected impact of these sanctions? Is it just to ostracize Russia or really what is it intended to do? Yeah, that is actually a great question um, because I think the intended impact um, has, has frankly shifted a little bit over time. Um, so the initial objective uh, before the invasion was actually to deter Russia from invading. And this was very clear. President Biden said, you know, if if the Russians invade, we will you know impose massive costs on their economy as a way to deter them from doing so. After the Russians went ahead and invaded, it was clear that that deterrent threat didn't work. Um, mm -hmm. I think the sanctions have have taken on maybe a little bit of a different objective, and I think it's it's maybe threefold. Um, one is they are still meant, I think, to uh, compel Vladimir Putin to the negotiating table um, sooner rather than later to maybe say, okay, we're going to pull out of parts of Ukraine or we're going to try to come to some type of ceasefire by making the continued aggression very, very painful. 
right? So that's number one. Number two, I think there is very much a punitive component to it. As you just mentioned, I think there is a real desire to punish Russia for what it's done. And candidly, Russia has commenced an invasion that has led to the, the deaths of tens of thousands of people. So there's you know credibility in that argument. And then three, I think there's um, candidly uh, an effort to reduce Russian capability and its ability to continue to you know, operate as a, as a global economy, not as a punishment mechanism, but maybe as a way to, you know, prevent it from being able to, to finance similar type of activity in the future. That's a little bit further afield, but I think those are probably the three primary reasons that are motivating the continued in, uh, imposition and escalation of sanctions at this point. And then if I think about a lot of these sanctions, it, they have a direct impact on the people in Russia, right? Who have nothing to do with the decision to invade Ukraine or anything else. From that sort of day-to-day -day life point of view, how much impact is it really, would you say it really is having? So I'm obviously not on the ground in Russia. I, so, clearly, I, yes. <laughs> I, I rely on, um, you know, on what I'm reading in the press, but I think the impact has been um, quite significant. There's the kind of immediate impact that you've seen. And then the sort of, um, longer term impact that you are beginning to see and will see. So the immediate impact, you know, clearly with the pullout of, you know, major corporations. So they can't use some of the major financial institutions. So in the immediate term, it, it's harder to, to just kind of do things as an ordinary Russian. I mean, the longer term impact is it's going to set the Russian economy back quite significantly. Um, you know, I've heard all sorts of different pred predictions about GDP growth or, or GDP um, shrinking you know, the ability to pay for, for goods and services. Um, so there will be longer term, really negative impacts on the Russian economy um, to, to what these sanctions uh, will do. And I'll also say candidly, you know, these sanctions, they're not really that targeted. So people usually think of this differentiation between kind of sanctions that are aimed at the population versus sanctions that are aimed at sort of the elites, right? Um, and there are elements of both here. There are elite focused sanctions. Those are the oligarch sanctions, right? And sanctions on the, the members of the Duma that I mentioned in the initial discussion. But a lot of these sanctions are focused, you know, really to put pressure on, on the Russian people. The Spurbank uh, uh, restrictions. I mean, Spurbank is the number one sized financial institution in Russia, but it's primarily a retail financial institution, right? Providing services to, to ordinary Russians. So there is a real element here of let's put pressure on the macro, on the Russian economy broadly and not just focus it on the, you know, the top 1% of the, of the country. Yeah, it's tough for the people living there. Obviously, they, they have nothing to do with this. So we also obviously have all seen, and you, Mention this: the, the multinational U.S. multinationals that are pulling, you know, out of Russia. They said they're they're no longer operating there. Obviously, there are still some that have operations there that are continuing to operate. But from listening to the list of sanctions, it seems like it's going to become increasingly difficult for them to do business, even if they've made the decision to continue doing business. So, for those types of companies. I know it's hard to predict, but will they be able to continue their businesses there? Or ultimately, if this continues, it's going to be hard to, you know, it may become difficult. It, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult. And, and the reason I think it's going to be difficult is it's going to be increasingly challenging to um, find counterparties, financial institutions, for example, to work with that are, that are not sanctioned. So right now, I'll give you an example. Um, right now, there are a, a, a wide range or a good number of Russian financial institutions that are not sanctioned. You can do business with them. They are still on SWIFT. So if you have employees in Russia that you want to pay, those employees can have accounts with those financial institutions and they can, you know, they can, they can go ahead and use those accounts. The challenge is going to be the Russians who are sanctioned are going to try to evade those sanctions. And one way they are going to evade those sanctions mm -hmm is they are going to try to find those banks that are not sanctioned and use them to get funds in and out, right? What's that going to cause to happen? Well, it very well may cause the U.S. to sanction those banks because those banks are now being used for sanctions evasion purposes. So you can see over time, it almost becomes sort of a whack-a-mole type of situation where legitimate financial institutions, because they're legitimate, 
um, are, are exploited and then are designated and are sanctioned. And as a result, over time, there are fewer and fewer of them, which means for companies that want to do legitimate business in Russia, there are fewer and fewer ways to actually bank that activity. Right. And then you combine that with what Jeanette's been talking about with all these different export controls and everything else. It really does start to isolate Russia from the rest of the world economy. So I want to get to compliance. Uh, before I do that, though, I, I want to talk about effectiveness of sanctions, which I mentioned up front. And happy, I've talked to Craig about this, but happy to hear your perspectives of if we've seen past sanctions work. And if you're willing to look into your crystal ball, that'd be fantastic. But if you just want to look back in history and say what sort of we've seen historically, that would be great. So I would say that um, I've never had a crystal ball. Every once in a while, I have a murky marble. <laughs> um, so looking at a murky marble, some piece of this depends on how you define effectiveness, right? And so when I look into my murky marble, which somehow routinely gets out of my grip, I think there's a definitional concern, a definitional concern around how do you assess, quote unquote, effectiveness? If the desire is, for example, regime change, that might not happen. And as Eric said, you know, that's very much of a long game. If it is to exert pressure, cause pain, certainly that's happening right now. And to Eric's point, that's happening very broadly. It's not just the oligarchs, for example. There's also um, something that we haven't talked about, Heather, which is the potential impact of what are called secondary sanctions. And secondary sanctions come into play when um, a party that is not immediately implicated, in other words, let's say companies in another country get dragged in because they do something that violates U.S. sanctions. The scope of U.S. sanctions, the definition of who is subject to U.S. sanctions is extraordinarily broad. The extraterritoriality of sanctions across the globe, and even more so because of the pluralistic nature of the sanctions involving Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, are so significant that I would not characterize this as a quote unquote effectiveness. I would look at impact. And I look to that impact as being, as Eric has already described, extremely broad, extremely significant. So yes, you can keep playing whack-a-mole and searching for that financial institution that you can do business with. And you might find that outside of Russia, in fact. There are some smaller banks, for example, in China that have a way of transacting those messages that are outside of the SWIFT system. But again, what is the cost of doing business? What is the cost of that? And, you know, we have heard, for example, the Secretary of Commerce, um, Secretary Raimondo, be very clear and explicit in saying that they will aggressively pursue enforcement action against parties that would seek to somehow circumvent or violate U.S. sanctions. Can I add to that? I think Jeanette's right on this. Um, you know, two, two additional points. One is I'll put on the, um, I won't look into my murky ball. Well, actually, I will in a second. But before I get to that, I'll, I'll take a, a reverse view. I mean, there are instances you've seen, I think, using a variety of sort of measures of effectiveness where sanctions have been effective. I mean, People point to, you know, um, causing Iran to come to the negotiating table uh, when it agreed to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. You know, in the 2014-2015 period, sanctions played a major role in driving the Iranians to the table. I think that's right. You know, there were arguments for sanctions effectiveness actually in 2014 in the Russia case. So a number of senior, now former and some current senior U.S. officials made uh, very public arguments that Russia was going to go further into Ukraine than it did in 2014, and it stopped because of the U.S. threat of additional sanctions. So a bit dated at this point, but I think it's a good example. And then even in situations where, you know, there's an argument that, well, the sanctions are meant to achieve, you know, the bar is too high, right? They're meant to achieve regime change, and no sanctions can ever do that. Even in those situations, there have been close calls, right? So the Venezuela example is the one I like to use on this. Is Nicolas Maduro still in power in Venezuela? Yes, he is. However, in, I believe it was 2019, 
there were press reports that he was leaving the country, like on his way to the airport to fly out of the country, likely to Cuba, uh, in part because of the pressure campaign, and only stayed, sort of turned back around because he got a call from uh, allegedly the Russians to say, we'll, we'll back you. So even in situations where sanctions didn't actually lead, for example, to regime change, there's an argument that they got that they got pretty close. Um, the the second comment I'll make on this one um, uh, about kind of looking into my murky ball is even if there is a significant change in Vladimir Putin's behavior as a result of the sanctions now, I don't see these sanctions being lifted anytime soon. Um, I really don't. And I think that there's the, for a couple of reasons. One, there's really no political will here in the United States to lift them. There's a sense that Vladimir Putin has kind of shown his true colors as a, you know, a, a dictator who's willing to, you know, kill thousands of people. And I just think as a result of that, that even if it's a situation in which he stops the offensive tomorrow, there won't be a political will here or in Europe to actually go ahead and, and lift any of the things that we've, we've put in place over, over the last month. And the second point is, that's to say nothing of the fact that, you know, U.S. and European companies, even if sanctions were lifted tomorrow, I don't think we'll be going back into Russia anytime soon. There are serious reputational risks. There are threats of nationalization. You know, everything is sort of leaning in the way of Russia becoming uh, very isolated uh, and sanctions staying in place for, for quite some time. So you anticipated one of my questions. So that was that was very helpful. So maybe final point, and it's probably the most important one for the listeners. So as you guys are aware, most of our listeners would be CFO or controller in that department. And I think you made this point early on, Eric, that perhaps the banks and some of the energy companies are very familiar with having to deal with this. But I think for many of our listeners, this has always been something sort of to the side and not part of their everyday business. And Jeanette, you made the point about ordering pencils. Well, even someone ordering pencils now, you know, maybe needs to make sure they're understanding all of these. So what should one of our listeners do now? So the first thing, because these are so very expansive, is really review your compliance programs. Understand what compliance measures you currently have in place so that you are able to pivot if necessary, right? So a lot of people immediately leap, for example, to, oh, well, screening new Parties have been designated. I need to make sure that my lists are up to date. That is like step one, right? Mm -hmm. So absolutely look at your screening and your escalation and dispositioning processes, but also understand non-list-based sanctions and export controls and understand, are you implicated? Companies that may not have thought before, oh, you know, what I make or my collaboration in, in, any number of industries um, may be subject to export controls now need to think about that, right? And say, well, what do I have? How am I affected? What are my touch points with these regulations? And do I have any kind of compliance measures that are in place to address those touch points? And then I would say, um, prepare for possible secondary sanctions. So don't think that just because, for example, I don't have a presence in Russia, I don't have a office in Russia, or I'm not directly selling to Russia, that none of this matters to me, because it very well could, and it might come through a very indirect means. It could be, for example, your operations in Vietnam or Malaysia or somewhere else that some that then have a touch point or that then become exposed to secondary sanctions later on. Yeah, it, I, I agree with all of that. And, you know, I kind of think of it in terms of three categories or periods of time. The first period, which is what we're in right now, is you know the zero to ninety day period, and really the the counsel that I would give is conduct a sanctions exposure analysis, understand your potential sanctions exposure, and take the immediate steps you have to to mitigate what that risk looks like. So it can be very basic, just kind of a what are our operations in Russia, who are all of our counterparties, what do we know about them, you know, and what mitigate what mitigants can be put into place. The second period is that kind of up to six months period. And that's where we're seeing a lot of our clients and customers really say, okay, if we have Russia exposure, we realize that there's going to be um, additional compliance obligations and additional compliance burden on our companies, right? You're going to need more people who, knew, who know sanctions better. 
and you're going to need a stronger governance process, right, to make sure that the issues that you need to resolve, especially in the C-suite, um, are issues that are actually being surfaced to you. Because if you don't have a good escalation process, you don't have a good governance structure, you may have the smartest sanctions subject matter expert in the world at your C-suite level. It may even be you. But if you don't see that problem, you're not going to be able to adjudicate it necessarily correctly. And then the third kind of phase um, that I think we're seeing folks begin to focus on is, you know, maybe out to maybe out to a year, six months to a year from now. And that's kind of the, the internal audit focus to say, OK, a lot of stuff just happened. We adjusted in the short term. We made some medium term changes to ensure that we were able to handle the inc increased compliance obligations. How did we do overall? Did we do well? Were there gaps in what we tried to do? And what can we do to ensure that next time, if there's a major action or series of actions like this, we're better prepared to deal with it or we're better, better situated to deal with it? That's kind of the three ways I, I see, three phases I see playing out with this. Just to further um, emphasize Eric's point about looking ahead, right? For example, this whole issue around the foreign direct product rule, again, is not new. It's something that the Department of Commerce came out in um, 2020 and said, we're going to expand this foreign direct product rule and um, increase the impact on parties that have been designated on the entity list. They've just expanded it to include Russia and then include um, designated parties from Belarus as well. So I would say that as you enter that third phase that Eric is talking about with the internal audit function, you want to think about readiness. You want to think about how am I positioned to understand and respond to geopolitical threats? And a lot of this is your conversations with our good friend and colleague, Craig Stromberg, right? Um, who contributes so, so, so much as wealth of information on that but it's something that increasingly companies have to be more aware of. And I would say that as companies are thinking about their compliance programs, I'm noticing more and more intersection with, for example, government affairs offices and so forth. All right. Definitely great advice. So just to wrap things up then for our listeners who are now realizing they need to know a lot more than they did before they started uh, listening to the podcast. So I think this may be the case that instead of people saying like, oh, now I understand that they're thinking, ah, oh, now I need to do a lot more research. What maybe each of you, if you have one or two sources that you would say, if, if you were someone trying to get up to speed that you would sort of send them um, any final thoughts on that. So Eric, I'll go to you first. Single sources are, are very challenging. I mean, to be perfectly candid with you, um, I would recommend talking to to an expert who knows who knows the area, and the only, it's just too much. It sounds like from what you were saying, that's exactly right. And, and and I mean, yeah, exactly right. There's no single source you can rely on for this. All right, Jeanette, do you agree with that? I agree with that. I agree with getting expert advice. You can also subscribe to various government websites. For example, the Bureau of Industry and Security has a landing page that is devoted to Russia and Belarus, where they've consolidated uh, a lot of the recent sanctions activities. OFAC, you can subscribe to OFAC's um, alerts as well, right, and get the Federal Register notices. The problem with that is these are very dense. Yes, right? it sounds like <laughs> 89 it. 89 pages of Federal Register. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Eric was pinging me one weekend when I was literally on page 34. I'm like, Eric, I don't know that I've gotten to the point with your question quite yet. <laughs> Give me another couple pages here. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that if you don't have the contextual basis, it, it can be really challenging to kind of make sense of that in a meaningful way for you and your organization. Yes, actually, uh, that makes total sense. Almost makes me regret asking the question because it seems like such an obvious answer once you, once you said it. But I do think even if you read pages you, to the point that was just made, you need to put it into context. You need to understand your business. I do think, though, getting some basic education is always good so that you can be more knowledgeable in having those other conversations. So from that perspective, I do think we've met our objective today to at least get people more knowledgeable about what's going on. And I really appreciate you bringing all your insight and expertise today. Thanks so much.
Heather, thanks so much for having us. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, it's been great to be on. And I've learned as much uh, probably as, uh, well, as you have, Heather. Jeanette probably knows most of it already, but I, I really appreciated it. All right. Great. Thanks again. That's our show for today. We're back tomorrow to dive into the impact that the invasion and related sanctions may have in accounting conclusions related to companies with operations in Russia and Ukraine, as well as companies doing business with companies that are otherwise impacted by the war. So that you never miss any of our audio content, follow the PwC Accounting Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.